Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad he looked beyond your faults and saw your needs? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God has looked beyond our faults, my faults, and God has seen our needs. For just a few moments, I want to share from both scripture texts, both the first reading and the second reading. We're going to try to marry both texts today in holy matrimony. And we will share from the subject what to do when conflict is all around. What to do when conflict is all around. Oh God, we thank you for this sacred moment of preaching. We ask that you would anoint my mind and my heart and my lips so that I might utter that which is sacred and from the heavenly dimension. And then in terms of our listening, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying as we deal with all of these conflictual dynamics in Jesus name, amen. As we consider both of our scripture texts, which are taken from this week's lectionary texts, a set of scriptures, four to five set of scriptures, earmarked for the church to read during the week and possibly we as preachers to preach from. As I was praying for sermonic focus for this Friends and Family Day, I could not shake how both the text in 1 Samuel and the text in Mark chapter 13 have a common theme running through both. Now, they tell two different stories, entirely two different stories that occurred at two very different times in biblical history. The one, the first one occurring before Israel had called its first king. The second time, the second scripture, the second one occurring many, many hundreds of years later before Israel and the world would realize that they were in the presence of the king of kings and lord of lords. The first scripture involved a family situation gone terribly wrong. The second one, a global and perennial and generational global system and situation gone bad. But despite the obvious differences between the two texts, I will be arguing for the next 20 minutes or so that they have a common theme. What's the common theme, preacher, that runs through both texts? Both texts reveal to us the drama, the pain, the tragedy, the difficulty, the desperation and the sense of angst and anxiety that one experiences when they're going through conflict or when the world is about to go through conflict. Serious human conflict is the theme. It's the common theme. The first text, the first one deals with serious conflict at the level of the familial, the familial. In other words, stuff jumps off in a family situation, a domestic situation. In fact, the text in 1 Samuel could be played out on an episode, a salacious episode of Jerry Springer, and be staged by his producers. It's that raw, y'all. It demonstrates a person-to-person family member to family member, relationship to relationship conflict among primarily three people, primarily. The kids are just collateral damage in the text. Conflictual dynamics are going on because of a difficult love triangle involving tears and arguments and accusations. 
And our first story shows the unwanted outcomes of an ancient version of a system which supports toxic masculinity. Now, I'm not saying masculinity in general is toxic, but I'm talking about there are toxic versions of masculinity that puts all of us in jeopardy. And here is a system of toxic masculinity in our text featuring two women caught up in a patriarchal system which plays on their vulnerabilities as women, which led to relentless ridicule and provocation and sharp disagreements between the women with one woman teeter-tottering on the edge of insanity. That, that's the first text, y'all. And maybe, as an aside, maybe on this Friends and Family Day, you know all too well about how the theme of family conflict works in family situations, sometimes very negatively. Don't look to your left, don't look to your right. You might give yourself away. You might incriminate yourself. But could it be possible that on your way to Friends and Family Day worship today at Calvary, a sharp disagreement took place? As you all were getting ready for the for church, don't don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. But could it be possible that on your way to friends and family day at Calvary, you all fought like cats and dogs? Maybe something came up that revived and caused you and someone else to rehash something that happened 2 to 3 decades ago. Or, or as you were grabbing something for breakfast, there was an uncomfortable silence at the breakfast table lingering from some tension-filled disagreement you all had last night. Then you know about familial conflicts. In his 1993 book entitled The Power, Passion, and Pain of Black Love, The Power, Passion, and Pain of Black Love, Dr. Jawanza Kunjufu, educator and publisher, discusses those painful aspects of our most cherished relationships when there is a communication breakdown in the relationship. He says, when this breakdown happens and conflicts are not resolved in quick time and communication goes south and goes haywire, women will begin saying things first in their heads and then in their hearts, things like, this man ain't nothing. And he will never be nothing. Stop trying to tell me what to do. You do what you want to do and let me do what I want to do. Get up and get it yourself. Why don't you act like a man? I, as a woman, a liberated woman, I do what I want to do when I want to do it. Shut up and get out of my face with that. I'm tired of you. You're full of sugar. You're full of sugar in my grits. Y'all thought I was going left. And then Kanjufu said, that when things have gotten really bad, men will say things like this. Nobody really wants to be with you anyway because you argue and fuss and fight all the time. Where's my dinner? I worked hard. I'm the man of the house. I'm the best thing that ever happened to you. Take your kids with you. You want to be the man of the house because your daddy was never around and that's how your mother acted like she was the man of the house then you act like the man of your house all the man of the house all you want but I'm not listening to you don't play with me this comes directly out of the book what I'm about to say don't play with me I will slap the sh sugar in my grits out of you I added the sugar in the grits part sugar in our grits. Kanjufu then writes, it is amazing the things that we say behind closed doors. People with degrees, church folks, people committed to liberation movements, people who appear to have it all together. 
would be in, embarrassed, greatly embarrassed, he says, if the entire world were able to listen in on some of these broken down conversations that we have. Isn't it true that we have all found ourselves in unwanted situations when we did not act our best or speak our best or love our best? When challenging conflict dynamics caused our communication to break down. And if you know something about this struggle, again, don't look to the left, don't look to the right then you will understand perfectly how this theme of family conflict was at work in 1 Samuel, the very first chapter, though the details might be very different from your own details. In this first scripture reading, we have the unfolding of serious family drama and conflict within the dynamics of a husband, a man named Elkanah, who had two wives. Not one wife and a side chick that he was keeping on the low low. Not one. Not one wife and someone he occasionally flirted with at work. No. He had, this brother had two wives. Two competing covenantal relationships and commitments. Two women he promised to hold and cherish and to be faithful to till death did them part. And the two wives have one husband. No, the math just wasn't mathing. Just wasn't mathing. Just wasn't adding up. Hannah and Penina are two women. They are the two women. To add fuel to the fire, he is a man led by his passions as a hopeless romantic because there is one of the two that makes his heart sing, makes his heart palpitate, and his palms grow sweaty. Elkanah has chosen a favorite and doesn't even try to hide it, y'all. But his favorite wife, Hannah, is unable to have children. But his second wife, Panana, Panina rather, is fruitful. And it seems all he has to do is look at her when they have their special to get day together. All he has to do is look at her and voila, voila. They have another child when it is their turn to be together. Can you hear the dysfunction that's in the relationship? I know that polygamy was practiced and allowed in the ancient biblical world as well as all around the world, especially near and on the continent of Africa, near and on the continent of Africa, which is the general culture with slight variations of most of the people who are written about in the Old Testament. But though it was practiced and allowed, it does not mean that it did not bring to the surface all kinds of conflictual dynamics and pain and jealousies, and anger, and bitternesses, deep-seated bitternesses. Because if we think about our text and compare it to a few other biblical texts, like what we have in the story of Abraham, Sarai, and the Egyptian sister, the concubine named Hagar, or what we have in the history and in the story of Jacob, and Rachel, and Leah, polygamy though it might have had some financial or provided some financial advantages to the sisters, it still provided many insecurities and places and spatial situations of dysfunction in those relationships, jealousy, accusations, and recriminations. So in our very first narrative, we have a lot of family problems that evolve and burn into inner warfare and conflict. And for preaching purposes, let's expand what is happening in this first story a little further out to our friendship conflicts and church conflicts. Oh, there we are now. Because if you read the story, this family in-house conflict spills out into a holiday celebration 
it spills out in public when they go out to eat on one occasion together. Penina is teasing Hannah on the low low and Hannah is all torn up because she cannot have children. She cannot hide her, her grief and her displeasure though she is the favorite wife. In her mind, God had turned God's back on her. And this sordid situation ends up spilling out into the temple, first the public as they were out eating and then into the temple. The pastor or priest, Reverend Dr. Eli, hears about it. And not only hears about it, he sees the residual effects of it himself as he attends temple business outside of the prayer room in the temple. And he sees Hannah going in and out for prayer for a period of time, she goes in and out for prayer. She goes in and out for prayer. He initially mistakes her deep grief for drunkenness by the way she's praying. Because of the depth of her pain, she goes to the altar in a strange way. She is unsteady as she approaches the altar. She can barely get an audible, coherent word out in prayer. She's her lips are moving, the Bible says, but nothing's coming out. Just as another quick aside, deep and prolonged personal problems and family conflict can cause you to keep going to the altar in unusual ways. Yeah, you might not go in traditional, cute, pretty ways to the altar of God when your pain is real deep. You might go to the altar stumbling, confused, not sure of where you are, tears in your eyes as you approach wherever you make your throne of grace. It doesn't matter how things look to other people as long as it's clear in your mind as you approach the altar. Let me let you in on something I have learned from theory and lived and observed experience. Oftentimes, what is going on in our personal lives, in our homes, among our friendships, what is happening in our marriages or our relationships with our kids or our grandchildren or with our parents and other relatives ends up popping up in inconvenient moments in the church one way or another. Often, if there are tensions, oh, this is going to be a nugget of golden truth right here. Often, if there are tensions in the relationships at church, you see people who can't get along with one another. It is because there are tensions within those people at home that has nothing directly to do with the other person. Or the persons are in tension with themselves or they are intentions with themselves oftentimes because it is impossible for any length of time to totally section off and bifurcate one part of the self and compartmentalize it from our whole selves over time eventually the real person's going to show up at the front door when the doorbell is rung we can only keep sending our best representative, the best representative of the self, to the door when the doorbell is rung for just a certain period of time. But eventually, the real us has to come to and answer the door. Yes, the problems and conflicts we are experiencing within ourselves, among ourselves, or with others at home, behind closed doors, will eventually show up in how we act up and act out in the church. You don't have to tell me, Pastor, I'm going through stuff at home. I don't have to tell you that I'm going through stuff at home. When I come to the church and the fourth time I come to the church and it's a repeated pattern and I'm acting a fool, I can't get along with nobody, I'm mean, I'm stuck up, I'm arrogant, I'm always pointing the finger at something else. That's because there's something pointing back at me. And, and sisters and brothers, that, that's okay. That, that's okay within certain parameters and margins because the church is a hospital. This is one reason the church exists. We are 
a hospital. The church is a community in the best situation that points people to the greatest marriage counselor, the greatest mental health counselor, the greatest life coach, the greatest arbitrator uh, the world has ever known because as we worship and praise and pray and study the word of God together and lean on each other and console one another, healing happens in the church house. And we learn how to better deal with those sometimes complicated family and friend conflicts. And in church, through studies and sermons and advice from wise sages who are in the church. You know, we got some wise mothers in the church. We got some wise fathers in the church. And through their advice, biblically based advice, we can then take the principles we have learned from the word of God and apply them and seek reconciliation and make some apologies. Somebody under the sound of my voice, you need to go home and make some apologies. You are then able to outline some, outline some plans to avoid the next explosion or con conflagration that tries to burn every relationship you have down. And this is my first point, y'all. And there's only two. And this first point is connected with the first text. How can we handle our family problems? How can we help resolve conflictual dynamics in our friendships? Hannah demonstrates an important approach. She shows us that we can find relief in the context of a healthy church system. Not a perfect church system, but healthy church system. Hannah understood this and when she was suffering, through the craziness of her family conflicts. She didn't run away from the house of faith. She didn't run away from the people of faith. Instead, she said to herself, I would imagine, I I've got to steal away and make my way out to the house of prayer today. I know the pastoral staff is there. I know that there are other spiritually minded people there. I know that there are folks who are praying for breakthroughs in the same sacred real estate that I'm going to. I know that historically my ancestors have done the same thing and it's turned all right for them as they leaned into their faith. So as I deal with these interpersonal conflicts at home, I'm not going to run away from faith. I'm not going to run away from my loved ones, but I'm going to run to faith and the house of God just like Harriet Tubman did, just like Jarena Lee did, that AME preacher, just like Julia Foote did, that early woman AME preacher, just like Fannie Lou Hamer did, and Mahalia Jackson and Rosa Parks, just like Barack and Michelle Obama did when they had tensions in their relationships, which they both mentioned in their books. We've got to lean on the transcendent power of God often experienced in the precincts of the church. And then we should take what we have learned from faithful friends, what we have learned during the hour of prayer, and what we have learned from sermons, and I hope you're learning something from a sermon every now and then, and then you need to take that back home, knowing that the God of peace will be with you. Because a healthy church, not a perfect church, but a healthy congregation is a safe space for you and me to find support and aid. We can find a place to vent in confidentiality with small groups of people the Lord will guide us to in the church. You can't tell everybody in the church your business, but God will point out to you a person or two or three that you can trust. So that all together, y'all can pray through together whatever it is that's causing you dismay. Hannah does this. For those of you who know the story, church is not perfect. Reverend Dr. Eli is not perfect. Greg Bryan is not perfect. You're not perfect. Listen, in the text, it takes Reverend Dr. Eli, it takes him a while to discern that she is not just some drunk playing games with the Lord. 
it takes him some time because he's not perfect. But eventually, he does come to know the truth, and then he gives her a word of prophetic insight. Sister, I know that you haven't come here drunk out of your mind, and now I know that God has heard your prayer. God knows your dilemma. So the next time you and your husband get together, as y'all sharing that white wine or that red wine, and you all listening to the latest Jewish R&B singer, stirring up that romance in you, everything is going to come together. Don't worry about Penina. She's my daughter, but don't worry about her. Don't think about her children and the seeming injustice of the situation. Enjoy your relationship, and you will have your own child a son who's going to be my prophet. Okay, this is the first story, the first text. But don't forget, we do have a second text, which deals with much broader conflictual dynamics. Here's the situation in the second text, and we're almost done. Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple area in verse 1 of Mark 13. They're leaving church. But as they are walking through the large series of buildings, ornate structures ordained with beautiful stones and metals, his disciples are temporarily overcome by the beauty and the immensity of the temple. And they call this architectural splendor and this, the imposing stature of the buildings to Jesus' attention. However, Jesus, having divine foresight and foreknowledge into the future, into future events, he begins a class on eschatology right on the grounds of the temple. What is eschatology, preacher? It is uh, when one teaches on the subject of end-time events. And he begins to share with his disciples who were just coming out of the temple with him, impressed with its size and beauty, not one stone will be left here upon another. There's going to be wars and rumors of war. All laid before us. All laid before humanity. Worst of all, the temple in Jerusalem would not be there to be the place of respite and spiritual comfort that it had been. Another side here as we make our way through this second text. Friends and family, now is the time while there is time, while the building is still up, to become anchored in the church. If there was ever a time, now is the time. There are so many conflicts, world conflicts, social conflicts, racial conflicts, gender-related issues, economic issues, where if we ever did need the Lord, now's the time we need the Lord. Jesus prophesied that the temple would not be around forever. Let that sink in. In fact, Jesus prophesied what has now become real history before it happened. He tells them before it happens that the temple in Jerusalem or the church for the Jews and early Christians in Palestine would be attacked, leaving not one stone on top of the other, which eventually happened 40 years after Jesus utters this prophecy. When Rome, under the authority of Caesar, destroyed the temple in 70 AD or CE, and this temple has not been rebuilt yet. When we think about what the Wailing Wall is in Jerusalem, that is just the side of one, one of the foundation pieces of that temple. The Temple Mount area is now inhabited by the Dome of the Rock, which is one of Islam's most sacred temples. It was built up in the same area. Jesus prophesied that leading up to that moment and afterwards, there would be apocalyptic or apocalyptic events and conflicts that were going to unfold in the world with the passage of time. And these global conflicts, these transnational conflicts would become so troublesome, so concerning, 
with nation rising against nation, people against people, kingdom against kingdom, system against system. There would be false messiahs rising up in power, promising to make the world and America great again. Promising promises that they cannot keep. Many will come, the text says, as if they are the Christ, saying that I, I am he. And then Jesus says, don't be alarmed. Don't be scared. Don't lose it totally. Keep the faith. This is what he says in so many words. He said, don't be alarmed. These things must occur. And this is what I've stopped by to say this morning or this afternoon today as an echo of the voice of Jesus. Manage your fears in this season. Manage them in Jesus Christ. Don't be overly anxious. Don't be overly alarmed. Don't pull out your hair if you still have hair. Don't be afraid to your core. Yes, be concerned. Be prayerful. Draw closer to God. Strategize. But Jesus said, don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Fear can't do anything for us, but paralyze us. Fear can't do anything good for you, but it can do a whole lot to you. Fear can immobilize you. Fear can freeze our movements and our work. Fear can stop us in our tracks and cause us just want to want to hibernate in beds in our homes. Fear can cause you to hear voices when ain't nobody talking. Fear can cause you to hear footsteps when nobody's walking. Fear is a dream killer. Fear is a pathway to sin and death if allowed. So don't be alarmed, my sisters and brothers, even if conflicts are mounting today, and they are. Even as earthquakes increase in number, with nature itself convulsing and warring in the land and air and seas, with floods and storms and famine, Jesus says to the believers, don't be afraid. Manage your anxiety with meditating on the word of God day and night. You need practical instruction, there it is. Meditate in the word of God day and night. More than meditating on global conflict, be aware of what's happening in the world, but be more aware of what's happening in the kingdom of God. Even as things and situations and people might become so filled with conflict and inner warrings that the faith of the very elect of God is going to be put to the test according to Jesus. Keep your eyes through it all on Jesus. The Jesus revealed in our biblical text. And in order to know the Jesus revealed in our biblical text, you, me, we, we've got to get into the word of God. I've been starting to say this more and more as I believe that day is approaching when the clouds part and Jesus return. While we're waiting, we need to work and get into the word of God. Study the word of God. Study to show ourselves approved work persons who need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing learning how to rightly divide the word of truth. Everything in the Bible is not for us today. Not everything, but you won't know that. I won't know that unless we systematically get into the word of God together. Jesus said, don't be afraid. Christians will be put on trial. But then Jesus says again, don't worry. And here Jesus gives us insight through his word. He says, don't worry. Why shouldn't we worry? This is worrying. Jesus says, don't worry because God is going to shorten the days so that folk won't be tried beyond their capacity to stand. I I'm right in the scriptures. God says through Jesus that God is going to shorten the days. Every evil hand that has power now won't have power forever. Every evil despot who's making plans to subjugate people and boost their own ego, they won't be sitting on thrones of power forever. God is going to shorten certain days and seasons so that power will be overturned back to the king of the kingdom. So Jesus said, don't totally you lose it. Manage your fear with faith because the Holy Spirit will give you in those hours what you ought to say, 
and speak, think, and do. I'm in the scripture. If y'all know this text, you know I'm really just talking, speaking verses from the text. Even when brother betrays you, sister betrays you, and a father betrays their children, and children rise against their parents. Jesus says, don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit will give you that which you need to sustain you and help you to thrive and more than survive in these tough days. Even as antichrist figures in the form of crazy emperors and antichrist powers arise. And now, perhaps during the first few years of a new American empire, as the foundations of our democracy seem to be shaking and teeter-tottering, and definitely as we look toward future years and events, when there will be a global falling away and a global idolatry and a bowing down to evil and the evil one, Jesus says, the pathway forward, friends and family, is don't panic. Settle it in your heart as I close to be one of the ones who will endure to the end. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Jesus said that those who endure to the end, they will be delivered. They will be liberated. They will be saved. But we need to count ourselves in the number right now as that as much as hell and high water comes my way, I'm not turning around. I'm not going back. In fact, I'm going to draw closer. I don't care what my friends are doing back home. I don't care what my folk on the block, my friends and associates are doing on the block. I don't care what my circle, my crew is doing on Saturday nights. What I'm going to do is take time to make sure that I'm rooted in God's word. I'm rooted in the faith. I'm going to make up my mind that I'm going to do whatever I need to do to be one of those ones who are enduring even to the end. Oh, sisters and brothers, that's good news, but it begins as I take my seat with the mindset. We've got to, while we have time, make up our minds. How do we do that, preacher? Well, I've been saying it throughout this message. We have to draw closer now. The way we draw closer now is by studying this word, fellowshipping, lifting up the name of Jesus in worship, living our lives according to the word that we've studied. You say, well, preacher, I'm not going to have any more fun if I live my life like that. I beg to differ. I've been serving the Lord since I was 18, about to turn 19. And how I was living before then, yeah, I had some fun. I had some pleasurable moments. But I also had a lot of grief, a lot of heartache, a lot of confusion, a lot of spiritual darkness at work in my own life. But when I gave my life over to Jesus and I said, Jesus, help me to be one of those who endures to the end, my whole life changed. My prospect in life changed. My potential in life changed. My focus changed. My hopes changed. My values changed. Did it take a few years? Yes, it took a few years, but I stand as one now who's not perfect. God is still working on me, but my whole life has been changed. My whole life has been transformed. And many of you can make the same testimony. Testimony, not a testimony. You're one who has a testimony. We're not testimonies up in here. Amen. Get thee behind me, Satan. The best is yet to come. As we stand to our feet, this is how we deal with conflictual dynamics within our families and at the level of global temptation and conflict. We make sure that we're still not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. We're making our way to the altar to pray to God, give voice to all of our anxieties. We're drawing close to God as God draws closer to us. And we're making up our minds that we're going to endure. Whatever I go through, we're going to endure. I'm going to endure to the end. I might have fallen yesterday as we prepare to sing the song of invitation. I sense that maybe somebody, you stumbled last night. 
you just got up from getting down last night, whatever getting down is. God loves you. God is patient. God is merciful. God can wipe the slate clean. God can give you a start over and over again. Won't you come back to the Lord? Come back to God's church. Is there one here today? There's nothing better. I'll sing it if I have to sing it. There's nothing better than knowing Jesus. He will pick you up. He will pick you up. And turn your life around. He'll turn your life around. Oh, I'm a witness. You ought to know Oh, you ought to know him. He's the best person get to, know to get to know. Is there one to my left, to my right? 